Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to Columbia Access Television. We're here on Stevens campus in Studio A, our high definition studio. And this is the second of our chats with filmmakers. We had one last week as part of our Cat Chat series. Uh, Missouri filmmakers come in and talk about their craft. Andrew Draws Palermo was here. And this is the first of our visiting filmmaker series from out of town. And we're really pleased uh, to have worked with the Missouri uh, Central Missouri returned Peace Corps volunteers to uh, collaborate on their third goal International Film Festival and um, it's such a great thing being in Columbia where we have access to these groups and to these wonderful people so uh, we really intend for this to be interactive so everyone in the audience please feel free to ask questions be part of this conversation um, and I think that's the only note I have as far as that's concerned I want to thank our sponsor Missouri Arts Council a state agency for allowing these types of events to happen, and Stevens College for allowing us to be here, City of Columbia for uh, support of our mission at Columbia Access Television. So I'd like to turn this over briefly to Mike Burden, who I've been working with for a couple months on this, and he'll talk about, he'll introduce our filmmakers and then also talk about a little bit maybe what's going on tomorrow. So. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Good evening. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure of mine to be here tonight uh, with these two guys who came into Columbia uh, Thursday evening and are enjoying the city so far, right? Absolutely. Great. Um, and uh, so we uh, are fortunate enough to have these guys as our guests um, and for the Third World International Film Festival and for the Filmmaker Workshop. And, and it's just uh, it's really a great opportunity to share global experiences with our community here, which is a, a very globally connected community. And uh, without further ado, I, I'd kind of like to get the conversation going. So on my left here is Jake Wilson. He was a Peace Corps volunteer in Lithuania, and that's where he and Sai actually met. They both served there uh, as educators uh, from 2000 to 2002. Uh, Jake loved Peace Corps so much. Uh, after returning home for a little while, he uh, volunteered to be a Peace Corps volunteer again and went to Malawi and served there from 2004 to 2007. And uh, upon uh, visiting Jake in Malawi, uh, Sai was inspired and uh, came up with a fabulous film as a result of that. Uh, Jake is currently a Peace Corps fellow and a teacher in Camden uh, near Philadelphia. Um, and uh, so everybody give a quick hand to Jake yeah. Wilson for coming. And on my right is uh, our filmmaker, Sai Kuchenbaker, mm. recipient of Fulbright uh, Scholarship. Um, maker of, of many great documentaries, including our feature film tomorrow, Bush League. And uh, we're really excited to get to hear about his approaches to filmmaking, about the craft, uh, about working with, with a friend, and uh, just everything that he has to offer. He also teaches photography um, in San Diego and uh, filmmaking. So uh, great pleasure to have you guys here, and uh, welcome to Columbia. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, let me just, uh, if I can, just say thanks first to for, for everybody who came out tonight. It's really nice to, to get to talk to you guys and be here with you. Um, let me thank uh, Columbia Access Television, too, and, and most of all, the uh, Third Goal Film Festival. Together, these two organizations brought us out here, and it's really, this is a, a really great area to visit. I've never been to Missouri. Last night was my first time. But Jake and I were talking about all the conversations we had which is people we met everywhere we went. So it's a, it's a very welcoming place. It's, it's really neat to be here, um, big honor. So um, I guess I'll just maybe lay out a brief narrative and then, and then Jake can tell some stories and vice versa. And when we get into the, you know, this is about filmmaking. So if you guys have questions that I'm, you know, I'm not going in that direction, feel free to, to jump in and kind of just, you know, direct us make it useful for you, okay? It shouldn't just be about us blabbing for an hour. Um, although I'm happy to do that. Um, so I joined the Peace Corps from San Diego in 2000. Um, at that time, you know, I was a very unqualified young person. I didn't, you know, so you can't really choose where you go. So I got a letter one day that said Lithuania. I didn't know where that was. I Googled it, and there was a picture of a dead tree in the snow. And that's about all I knew when I departed. Um, I met Jake in Chicago. He was from Jersey. And so we were there for two years. While I was in the Peace Corps, we were English language teachers. Um, I had a degree in film as an undergrad, but I hadn't ever made anything. I was more like watching movies and reading about them. 
it was while we were in the Peace Corps, my values really shifted because of the people I was meeting in Lithuania who were working so hard for every little opportunity they had. I realized that I could be a filmmaker if I was willing to work. And that was kind of a revelation. So I went directly to grad school after film school, or sorry, after Peace Corps. Um, like, and like they said, Jake went on to Peace Corps Malawi. <clears throat> um, during grad school, I got a Fulbright grant. I went back to Lithuania and I started to shoot a movie that I worked on for two years to write. It was this very large uh, period piece, which for a student's absurd. A period piece is, in terms of resources, it's incredibly demanding in terms of what you have to have to make a period piece. So I got the grant, I went back to Lithuania, and the film, <clears throat> literally after two months of pre-production, just literally uh, exploded in one day. Everything failed. And it was literally one morning, the, the project that I worked on for two years was just, just dust. So um, uh, I'll set the weapons up and then we can get to Africa. Mm -hmm. Most of the work I've done in the last four or five years is in Africa, but the, the route to documentary starts with this little film I made in Lithuania. The big project failed. The only thing I had left, there were two actors, two older men who were retirees, who were very interesting guys. And they were retired filmmakers. They understood the language of filmmaking. And they were, they were good actors. So I decided, let's make a movie with these guys. Um, and let's, the, mis the mistake I made early on was I was trying to take, if I, I had $3,000 to make a movie. But I was making, I'm, I'm trying to make a movie that would cost 50000 so I was trying to turn one dollar into ten by asking for favors, by stretching everything. So after that thing collapsed, I realized what I need to do is the exact opposite. I need to look at my resources and use half. So that every, every 50 cents I spend, I have a 50 cent buffer beyond it. And then that means I can actually execute. I can actually do what I need to do. And I have this elastic space um, to adjust and to have fun. That was the main thing. Filmmaking. Oftentimes, actually, isn't fun when you're in the process. So, you know, eight-hour days working versus 18-hour days is a huge difference. So, this way, we can have eight-hour days. We can enjoy the experience. So, um, we'll cue the uh, <clears throat> the orphans. This is the, the last. This is the back end of the film I shot. This little short film with these two actors. And this this genre is actually called documentary fiction, which is like the True False Film Festival in Colombia. This is one of their areas that they really specialize in. Films that sort of overlap between documentary and traditional fiction filmmaking. So maybe we can watch that clip and then <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about it before we get to the Africa stuff. Mm -hmm. if that's okay. Tape, tape.
so that's that's the back end of the film. But the the mode, the method of making the film is is a documentary style, and that nothing in the environment is under our control. We would just go to locations and start shooting scenes, and whatever would happen would happen. And you know, we would do it multiple times to try and get the takes correct. But um, for people, filmmakers working with very little resources, um, it's a great way to work because you don't have to try and spend money and get permits and stuff like this. Of course, the risk taking is slightly elevated. Um, I think that you should kind of add where that story came from. And we were kind of talking about that this, this afternoon. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, so these two actors, the day that the, the other film collapsed, I met these two actors to give them the last version of this script. And they, they got to my apartment a little bit late, and they said, we're sorry we're late, but every year we celebrate the birthday of a friend of ours who passed a decade ago. Um, which, you know, I think if a lot of people said that, you might, it almost sounds like a weird cliche, but you could feel the meaning from them. They were dead serious about it. It was authentic, and, and I thought it was really moving. So as that other film was collapsing, this little moment kind of stayed with me through the next couple of days as this thing unwound and completely just dis, uh, disappeared. So I was thinking, well, I have to do something while I'm here. I'm here for a year. I have to shoot a film. And this little story they told me was a really strong kind of emotional kernel that I knew that if they were the actors, this would be the touchstone. So the story that we made up, it's a, it's a completely fictional story, but the story is that this guy who passed away, um, I fictionalized this, that he passed away in Berlin, and that the, the sort of drive of the film was that they've got to go to Berlin to pay their respects because he just passed away. So these guys go to Berlin, they have secrets between one another. They travel to Berlin, and they can't find the grave. So this is the, most of the, it's a search film. They're going all around Berlin trying to find their friend, basically. All that part, all that other stuff was fictional, but this core idea was really authentic. And for an actor, that's a really powerful tool to be able to connect to a story emotionally, you know? And so even in that last scene, you know, they're sort of saying their final goodbye, you know, as I'm directing, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, remember that, you know, I really want you to think about your actual friend. Even though we're in Berlin and that's the one, none of that actually happened here, please, you know, think about him. And their performances were, I thought, um, pretty authentic. When this project was done, though, uh, it, by that time, Jake was in Malawi. So he'd been back in the States. I went to, to, he went to Malawi. I went to Lithuania for one year. So I saved some of the grant money and I bought a ticket to Malawi to visit him for a month. <clears throat> so before we get to the next film, do you want to talk about your first year in Malawi? Sure. Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, yeah. About that film? Anyone know questions about the first part? Feel free to. Yeah. Share, but um, what what was it that caused the other film to collapse? Oh, that, no, that's a good question. I don't mind at all. No, actually, in fact, very, for filmmakers, like I teach film in San Diego, what I talk about more than anything else are my failures, because I've failed so many times now. <laughs> but that's where all the lessons are. But uh, it collapsed mainly because I didn't know how to produce. I was being trained to direct fiction at school. I went to Keller Arts, it's a great film school, but uh, producing is a very special skill. Producers are the people who deal with reality in filmmaking. They, they have to do budgets, they have to look at you know, locations, how do you actually get resources? Directors don't. Directors just dream stuff up and hope it happens, right? So I didn't know how to produce at all. So I was trying to shoot in Eastern Europe, which is a challenging place to shoot anyway, as a foreigner. I had a complex script that was set 60 years ago, shot at a time of year seasonally that's difficult. So it was supposed to happen in late autumn in Lithuania, which is like deep winter here, right? So that means changing with snow. It gets dark at 4, 3.30 Very short days. And the country itself, at least at that time, there weren't very many um, film professionals to support an activity like that. Plus, I had no money. I had no idea. Long story, I had no idea what I was doing. Right? I was really ambitious and I loved this story. I still love the story that I was trying to shoot. I was, I'm still quite committed to it. But uh, a period piece requires, at the most basic level, period costumes, period props, right? Even if you don't go any farther, you're already talking about what are actually substantial resources and substantial support because you have to have an art director that is good. So 
Uh, so those were the first problems, but things really hit the skids when I had an agreement with the studio. There was, most of this, this, the uh, Soviet states had a big Soviet studio. So there's this giant Soviet built studio in the capital city, um, but it's not very active, at least it wasn't back then. But I had to deal with them. They would provide all the fake guns. But these are pyrotechnic, so the guns actually fire. They're just not real guns. The day we went to the studio to break out what would be an army's worth of guns, right? The woman said, well, you know, there aren't any guns in the whole country, and every pyrotechnics expert is in Estonia for a film shoot. There are literally no fake guns in this country. So that's when I knew, okay, things are on route, right? Yeah. And it just kept going that day. So right after that, the art director quit. I got in a car accident before lunch. I saw the two older actors, and I thought, okay, there's something, at least there's two guys are still in. After that, I can't, we had to drive to see the star of the film performing a theater piece, and he was a terrible actor. <laughs> he was good in rehearsals, but when I saw him on stage, I was like, this is, this is really bad. And then, really what, what drove it home was, in the meeting after we watched his theater piece, he got drunk and lectured me about, um, how I was connected to Hollywood, because I'm an American, and as a consequence, he, I would need to quadruple his salary. <laughs> or I had the choice, I could go do it with school kids, he, this is like a quote, or you can go do it with school kids in the village and let me know how it goes. Right, so I was like, okay, this project's done. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's no Band-Aid this big, right? But, you know, I think the real problem was any of that stuff. The real problem was that I didn't, my ego was involved, and my, my idea now, especially in documentary, is that if your ego is involved, like mine was, sort of a competitive spirit, serendipity does not greet you, right? When and since then, the, the efforts I've made that, are, that aren't really connected to my ego, that are much more connected to ideas like listening and curiosity, serendipity has a bizarre way of, of sort of making itself present. In moments when you never think anything, it's just, just sort of, the world just sort of opens. So, you know, that was the real mistake. The real mistake was that, you know, I, I sort of went into the whole thing with a sort of very American, competitive, ambitious attitude. And when I hit the obstacles that I hit, those things weren't the tools that can get you through. Right? So, big lesson. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I want to know, um, you studied film. Yeah. And you said you, you know, watch all the film, but I would like to know what, how big is your music collection? Well, you and know, how, I, play, and, I play music. Ah. So um, okay. I never had a big music collection, but I did grow up in a house where music was pretty, I mean, I think most households are. But I can't say that, you know, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but when I was probably 10, my mom was a U2 fan, the band U2. <clears throat> so I would come off of school and I'd hear Janis Joplin, Bruce Springsteen, Prince, David Bowie, and U2. And one day I came home and my mom took me, you know, I was probably 10 or something. She said, Si, you know why u is a great band? This is before Joshua Tree, their big, big one. And uh, I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> and she said, they're a great band because they stand for something. Right? And actually, I think to this day that that really sticks in my head that, that artists can have this other side, this other sort of thing that they do, you know, and that, you know, that you stand for something. So I think music's influence in my life is probably more from that end, actually, more like a political point of view than certain other things. But then I started playing music when I was in my 20s. And I do view all of this as sort of one big thing, you know, it comes from the ether, you know. Heard at the end there. Mm -hmm. um, how long did it take you to find that? Or that's was it composed by a friend. That's so when uh, we were in the Peace Corps, okay. we were trained. We had we have all these teachers when you first go in there teaching language and culture and stuff. The guy who happened to be our culture trainer was a, was a was a very well trained musician. He learned in Luxembourg. So when and while went, we were there, he became famous. Yeah. He became a famous he pop He started star. writing pop, pop music and represented yeah. Lithuania at the Eurovision Awards. Right. Yeah. 
So when I went back, we talked and he said, I want to score your film. I said, well, let's just do uh, kind of a prototype and see how it goes. And he produced just this beautiful music. It was stunning. So it really made the film much better, right? Um, but that has very little to do with me. That's, that's good composing. Yeah. Anyway, are we on to Africa now? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about your first year. Okay, well, um, I was probably in Malawi for about a year before Sai came to visit me. So I had about, and, and I didn't know that he was coming. Obviously, I was living this life, and I was assigned uh, to a forestry department counterpart. And as Sai kind of mentioned, my first year in Malawi was an absolute failure. You know, having already been in the Peace Corps, I kind of knew what I needed to do which was really understand the language, and that was going to make or break me. And I, you know, I, I learned that in Lithuania. So one thing that I really focused on was learning Chitambuka. Um, tried to initiate certain projects, but nothing really worked out, which is very common you know, as a Peace Corps volunteer, and you can become very frustrated. But I think what was more frustrating than that, because um, I didn't set very high expectations that first year, was that I was placed in the so-called royal village, and in other words, my landlord um, living next to me was the most powerful chief in the area. And he wasn't so interested in development projects more than sort of manipulating me and somehow squeezing resources out of me. And I realized, soon realized that, probably after a few months being in the village, and tried to get myself out of that situation. And it just didn't work out and went and talked to Peace Corps and they told me to stick to it. Um, so by the time that Sai had arrived, I'd say that I had certainly established friendships. I had certainly isolated myself from that chief, which took some time, even though we were still living next door to each other. I certainly made it clear to the rest of the, the villagers and, you know, his subjects, so to speak, that I was not there for him. I was there for them. That took me a very long time to do. So by the time Sai came, I think I was still a bit frustrated, but I had certainly made enough connections that he was able to put the troubles in Zolokere together. And when he came, uh, I don't believe that you had anything in mind really to produce. Yeah. Yeah. All he had was his camera and sort of the things that I had learned. And at the time I was working with a boys club and talking about HIV and gender equality issues. I was community gardening. I was building mud stoves with women, trying to teach them how to conserve, you know, valuable resources like wood. Um, and so I arrived, and I was probably at that point fairly comfortable speaking Tumbuka, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I was very healthy, and, um, and after Sai left, things started to take off for me. And it wasn't because he came with the camera, um, but I think that what was a valuable lesson for the both of us, at least, I th you know, I don't know how you feel about that, but was that Sai so pulled out his camera and started filming my neighbors and filming my friends and filming all the people that were living in my village and filming myself. And I was very comfortable with that. It didn't necessarily bother me. I didn't change in front of the camera, I don't think. And I think that kind of set the stage for Bush League, in a way. Um, so, and oh, let me add that one thing that, that I was beginning to think about was that we had located and identified a village that was probably five kilometers from where I was living that wasn't serving or didn't have school. And my village was serving all the children from that village. And the reason that the youngest children were not coming up to Zolokere, to the village, was because the road was flooding out. So a lot of the, lo the older kids, the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders, could come and, and they were getting their education in our village. But the little ones, the first and the second graders, for months, for the rainy season, would never come up to school. So at a very, very crucial time in learning, you know, these children aren't. And my dad had come to visit, and we, my dad is an educator, and retired, and he came and he re was really interested in speaking to teachers, and headmasters, and principals, and um, he went home and said, I want to do something about this. Like, we need to build a school there, whether it's one room or two rooms, or a hut, or whatever, it, you know, whatever it is, let's do something. So, I had communicated that idea to Sai. And he had this footage that he took when he was there the first time. And he went back 
to the States mm -hmm. Back to at that point school, yeah. and put together um, from those six hours a film called The Troubles in Zola Kedi and sold it or we tried to sell it to raise money for my school project and I think we probably made about a thousand dollars from that or 50 so. I mean, bucks it, it turned into a joke really 50 bucks you know I mean tops. he has still yeah. has boxes in his closet yeah. of copies of this Drink film coasters. you know <laughs> yeah um, but nonetheless, the, yeah. any, any little bit helped. But it was actually a really good idea because when I was at home, I was able to fly home to do some fundraisers. I was able to hand that out to people. And, or I was at least able to give um, people an idea of what I was looking to do. Even though the film had nothing to do with me building a school, they could at least start to visualize in their brains what is really going on over there. They can't really see from my letters and from my emails and even from some of my photographs what it is that I'm doing. And, um, and also that I'm looking for, I need trust. If I'm gonna ask somebody for money, you know, I want them to realize that I am well suited to receive that money to initiate that project. You know, I mean, this is a country that's 12,000 miles away. Do you really wanna write a check for $1,000 to a guy like me who maybe you don't know is you know, gonna be effective or not? So that film, I think, was very helpful. Even though it didn't raise all that much money, I think it raised awareness. And um, one of the subjects in that film turned out to be uh, one of my very, very close friends. And she became later a subject in Bush League. So. so we'll watch a clip right now. But just to give you the filmmakers kind of, so I went to Malawi for a month from Lithuania. And, and you know, Malawi, Africa, if you ever get the chance, is just an extraordinary place to be a visitor. Um, and then to have a friend that can sort of bring you in um, and show you things was really very, very special. So, I mean, I was smitten within the second, you know, third days of my visit there. But I had no background about Africa. So I started just shooting video and we'll watch the back end. This is the last four or five minutes of this little film I put together. I sort of scraped together so maybe Jimmy can play it out. When we got back, I talked to Jack Lane. She introduced me to a woman that was HIV positive, had three children. Her first and second husbands had already died of AIDS, and two of her children were also infected. Her name was Judith. So how, how old is Judith? Two years. No, this one? How old is she? Yeah. The child? No, her. This one? She was here. Yeah. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. How old were you when you married the first husband? I'm going to get the woman. I'm going to get the woman. 16. 16. How old was he? I'm going to get the woman. I'm going to get the woman. He was 35. Yeah. You were 16? No. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask about their sex life? Is that too much? I don't think she should ask that. No. I can't ask I if he... I think you can ask. Huh? But after... You can ask. After... You can ask. Okay. Judith and her husband, her second husband... Okay. Or actually, I'm sorry, her first husband, were still having sex. Yeah. After he tested HIV positive. Yeah. They were. Yeah. Can you ask Judith? Yeah. Ask me what I'm going to do, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to yeah. Did she know that she would get HIV from him? Yeah, she knows. Yeah. She knows. Yeah. How does she feel about him now? What's so man? I know you know. Man, I know you are good. You want to know me? Go with me. 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 She said that sometimes you come fear I'm going to die. Sometimes you come, how can I do to care this child? But not anyone to help us. How she can stay, how she can do. Yeah, she's just thinking but she don't know where is. Yeah, where can she stay? She won't hear anyone to teach her. You must do this, you must do this, if you want to stay a long time. 
but no, no voting to teaching. No. So this is a, this is a hard question, but what happens to the children when Judith dies? It can become an orphan. No anyone to care. That's it. Yeah. I almost don't even know what to say. And they go to an orphanage? When your mother come die, they come in orphan. And is there a place for orphans to live? Here? Yeah. No. Just a group to care. Yeah. Not a village to care. Mm -hmm. That's the volunteers just to see it. Even our culture. We can't. And if your husband, if I could reach it. His parents, they call you and say, go in peace. We have no power, women, in family. You are under your husband. Where there is doing wrong, we can't shout. Yeah, they said your husband pay money to your father, your parents. So you are a slave, just the same as you are a slave. When the women here we care about each other as a man, ah, if they said simple. All of them is a die. You are going to die, and also me, I'm going to die. If you're going to seek malaria, you are going to die. Meningitis, you are going to die. HIV AIDS, you are going to die. So why? I'm a fee. I'm going to die. I'm going to marry you. All of them is a die. They said so. My. Not can it change, but does she want it to change? Yes. She wants it to change. So, how do you guys feel? <laughs> so this was this was another big lesson about filmmaking for me. So I made this. Uh, I was in Malawi for a month. Went back to grad one more year in grad school. So, <clears throat> and the footage that I had was not. I didn't shoot in a way to construct the film. I was just sort of shooting home movies more or less and doing interviews out of curiosity, just to talk to people. So I mean, this, this is, that's how the film ends right there. And so I did start to show it to people, my friends and family. And, and oh, I what my dad said. Do you remember? It's, yeah, well, you, maybe you can say what your dad said. I don't remember. Exactly. I just remember getting a phone call from my father saying, yeah. what, is, what in the world is I doing? Yeah. People yeah. aren't going to want to watch this. Yeah. They're going to walk away from this and think, hey, yeah. well, you know, why can't he just lighten it up a little bit? Right. You know, that was my father's reaction before I had even seen it, you know? Yeah, so I was shooting in living rooms, and um, you know the thing about this though is that I was going to I was going to a film school, but I was going to an art school. Um, and your audience in an art school, like these are sort of hardcore audience. They're used to the sort of harshest, you know, um, raw stuff that's that's ever made. But so I showed the normal people in the living rooms, and, and it took me a really long time to figure out what was happening because there'd just be kind of you know like you know kind of silence and stuff. And finally, I realized like, oh. It's just, there's only one thing happening. People feel sad. That's it. In other words, like, it's like an almost, an, the film is more alienating in many ways um, than anything. So that was a really big lesson in filmmaking, in documentary filmmaking, is that if you want, you know, you can alienate an audience really easily by just sort of pounding them with bad news, right? But what I had done unknowingly is I tapped right into a very deep tradition of Western sort of, you know, North American and European storytelling about Africa. And that is Africa as one of a few things. Africa is the heart of darkness. Either that or it's, you know, Nova. Africa is the Garden of Eden with very special animals, but no human beings. Right. Um, and then the third new, the, the most modern version of it is Africa is a good cause. Right all three of which are very problematic ethically for a filmmaker. Um, and what I've done is fallen into the heart of darkness mode of Western storytelling in that here's this place where people are suffering, everybody's sort of, um, these stories about death and, you know, women who are disempowered. 
and, and even if those things are true, um, without telling the other elements of the story, the larger story of society, the other things that were happening, what you end up with is this sort of, um, well, a story that falls into that, that old tradition, but also that is just not dynamic. You know, it is not, it is not today, right? So, and it took me a while for all this to sort of settle in, you know, what had happened in terms of this little film. So the film in many ways is like a little prototype, a little practice crack at telling a story about Africa as a North American Caucasian male. And these things are all very important. You, can't, you can never remove, I can't remove my gender or my ethnicity or my, my cultural background at any moment when the film is being made. So about, was it two years later? Mm -hmm. Roughly a year and a half later, I finished grad school, and I, I thought, okay, the first thing I'm going to do is go back to Africa and shoot a movie. The Lithuania film did really well, <clears throat> um, but it made me really uncomfortable because I felt my roots were like Peace Corps. Um, Just to back up what you're saying right yeah. there, too. I mean, I, as, as somebody who spent three years in Malawi, that film doesn't represent Malawians. No. They're very happy people, yeah. and that's the irony, is that... That's what I wanted to learn from them, is mm -hmm. how do they find this happiness, this connection to the universe, or, or whatever it might be, that can allow them to wake up and smile and look and say, Mawukuli dada, imwe mui makola, every single morning, and by every single person that you walk by. And then, like, I think the reason my dad was so very critical is he had already been there. He watches that and says, that's not the yeah. people I met in the village. Why is it so sad? Right. You know? Right. So... You know, some of it, you know, some of it can be in there, but you just have to have the other parts. You know, you have, if you've got all this really dreadful stuff, then you're not showing the sort of the positives and the sort of, you know, other sides of life, then it, it's just not, it's not as honest as it could be. I think the larger problem is that myth. You know, this myth is just massive in Western society. And I would argue that Africa for 300 years has been used as proof of civilization in other places. It's the other, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I look back at that film, I'm like, wow, I really just fell into that one face first, you know? So, um, but that, you know, that's how you grow. But when I went back to shoot uh, Bush League, um, by that time, I still didn't know a lot about Africa. I knew much more. I also was aware of my mistake. Um, and... <sighs> and I was fully engrossed in the school project. Yeah. And yeah. B by that point, I'm already there for two years, um, had already made plenty of friends, but also enemies. Because at a point in the village, I had to decide. I had to make a decision here. You know, okay, I am going to take on some projects, and I'm going to alienate myself. Because when you have resources, and everybody's looking at you as a somebody who has those resources, as soon as you make that decision to work with this soccer team, to work with this particular village, to work with this particular CBO or community-based organization, then the other community-based organization, the other soccer team, the other village, becomes envious. And um, I had made that decision. Probably a few months after he left, when he was shooting The Troubles in Zolo Kere, I decided to work with a local soccer team. And it was my village, and the village that I was working in. And we started a tomato gardening project. We were irrigating through the, the dry season. Uh, we bought a treadle pump through a donation, and we were farming, and we were making money. And some of the money that we made, we were able to buy cleats and shin guards and new uniforms. And we'd show up in the neighboring village, and my guys would have new uniforms and cleats. And, and, and we'd be driving up in a truck, you know, and the other team would have no shoes. You know, and imagine all of that anger and envy gets directed one place, right to me. You know, I am responsible. I'm the one who's given them those uniforms. It's not their hard work, it's not their tomato project, it's the Mzungu, right? It's the American guy. So in that, I became very defensive, you know, and um, started the school project in a neighboring village. So I, I decided to take all these resources that I had and um, go to Kutamaji, which I had spoken about earlier, the, the village that my dad had identified that didn't have a school, and build a school there. And we raised about $22,000, $21,000, in the States um, that I brought over and began school project. And at that point, when Sai showed up um, to film, I was probably 70% complete, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at my worst, you know, and in a, in a bad place. 
because I was managing everything. I had certainly bitten off more than I could chew. I'm the project manager. I'm the accountant. I'm the guy hiring people. Right? I'm on the job site. I'm the driver. I'm the one picking up the, the materials. I'm just doing way too much. And I don't have trust in other people. And I'm trying to trust people. And I'm trying to work with them. Um, and the people that I'm working with in Kutamaji, in that neighboring village, can't stand me. And I'm taking it personally. You know, they don't like me because I got boots, or, or they call boots, cleats, for my soccer team. So every time I show up in Kutamaji, they're like, yeah, we'll mold your bricks, no problem, sure, we'll carry them over there. Don't we have a game with you this weekend? You know, that sort of attitude. Um, and rather than being sensitive and understanding, I think I just kind of said, all right, you want to be that way? Well, I can battle you, no problem. So I'm in battle mode, and this guy gets off a plane with a camera and starts rolling. For three months. For three months. Yeah. You know, I don't mind that the camera's there, obviously, because I'm just being myself. But certainly, after I return home and watch some of the footage, I say to myself, man, I'm crazy. Did I really let him film that? Did it, is this really? <laughs> um, and and I'm, obviously, we can talk more about that um, a little bit later on, but, you know. Well, the final product, I mean, one of the stories I wanted to tell was, you know, I've been a Peace Corps volunteer, and, you know, Peace Corps has got a very politically sort of correct image and, and the stories are often similar. You know, so if you say it for somebody, you know, for example, I was in the Peace Corps, they'll say, oh, you're a good person. Like this is sort of a, a typical Very response. noble. You've done a very noble but thing. The, yeah. yeah, but the P and maybe maybe that's a little bit true, but the Peace Corps as an you know as a, as an individual, I mean, you are often taken to your foundations in many ways. I mean it can, it can shake your world. Sometimes you you have great days and sometimes you have very bad days and you have feelings and all this. It's just a really complex experience. And I, uh, in terms of films and stuff, had never seen anything that I felt was like an honest portrayal of what it's really like. The only thing is Paul Thoreau, the writer. Paul Thoreau, I think, writes very honestly about his Peace Corps experience, which was also in Malawi. In the mid-60s. Yeah. He was eventually thrown out of the country as well. Yeah. So, I mean, in many ways, even though Jake was in the middle of a, a tumultuous period in his career as a Peace Corps volunteer, the, what I got on camera, at least I thought, was, you know, this is... This is like, this is it. This is what happens, and it can happen to anybody. And sometimes it's like plus, and sometimes it's minus, but it's human, right? You're not some saint. You're in a distant place, far from your home, far from your friends and family, and you're vulnerable, and sometimes these things happen. So, so it was a big opportunity to try and tell a Peace Corps story in a way that I thought was much more, um, well, from my point of view, honest. Um, but the other things that were happening sort of underneath the film was that I'd watched before I went back. I started to watch lots and lots of films made by North Americans about Africa. And I was actually really shocked at what I saw. There's, there's scenes that actually repeat in, in other films. So, and there, these aren't films made by the same, same filmmaker. So one theme you'll see over and over is the HIV test scene. And the way these usually go is it's, it's a, a, either a young woman or a young man goes in for an HIV test. Um, and in every film, the results, you could guess what is the result? They're positive, right? So as a viewer, your impression is like everybody's positive, everybody's HIV positive, and even in the countries with very high rates, like what was in Malawi, 17%? That, that's what they claimed. Right, so ballpark between 17 and 14%. Well, what this really means though is that eight people out of 10 don't have it. But watching these films will really skew your perception mm -hmm. of this place. So there's that, that's the theme. Another thing you'll see a lot is the visit to the orphanage. And the, the way this scene usually goes is the director of the camera, first you meet the teacher, the teacher explains the situation with the orphans. Um, they explain that there's no resources at the school and that is followed by the orphans singing. They'll sing a song and almost every single time the song they sing is about loss. Right? Now in the real setup, as I've seen it, as that really happened, chances are the kids probably sing five or six songs. But the song that makes it into the cut is the one where the kids are essentially singing about the parents they lost, and inevitably some of the kids will cry. So there'll be close-ups, right? And these scenes actually repeat in different films. And the reason it's problematic, I mean, a lot of these films are being made because they're, they're sponsored by institutions who have a vested interest in aid efforts in Africa. So they have a very specific agenda. It's not a negative agenda, but it is an agenda. But what they have to do is tell a certain story to motivate support. So when I went back, I had a lot of this in my mind. I was like, okay, wow. I had no idea that this dialogue was sort of so well patterned, right? 
So when I get back, it's like I want to make a film um, where there's no Western experts. Because what a lot of documentaries you do is you cut to a university professor who sort of fills in gaps. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a place for Western expertise. There is. I had to study so many different papers written by you know, Western doctors about Malawi's politics in order to finally understand what I'd seen. So you need that, but I just didn't want it in the film. You know, the talk. I wanted the experts to be people from this village who, who they themselves would describe what happened. Jake was one, and there's three other main characters in the film, all of whom are Malawian. Um, the other thing, though, that by this time I'd started to come around to is the idea that as a director, <clears throat> my job wasn't really to do much more than to listen and to be curious, but as informed as you can possibly be. When I was sort of a younger filmmaker, I thought that the best thing you could do was not know anything and enter a situation and sort of just ask questions and follow it. And I, th I threw that out when I realized, like, no, you need to know as much as you possibly can. There's a simple reason for it. Uh, for example, with Jake, I knew I had a lot of knowledge about Jake, so what I could do is say, okay, I know the story I'm telling about Jake is Jake is a Peace Corps volunteer. He's going to school. And so I know that, for example, one scene I have to have in this movie at the end is I have to see Jake in the school once the school is constructed with the students. It has to get tied together, right? So what it allows me to do is I know, okay, that's not going to happen for three weeks. So before that, I can put the camera down. And, and nobody ever talks about this in documentary filmmaking, but probably the most powerful thing you can do is stop shooting and just engage with the people you are following and not shoot them, right? Just, just be there. You don't talk about the things you know you need on camera, right? You don't have the critical conversation that needs to happen on camera. But you put the camera down, and then when the camera comes back up, the level of rapport will be better and better and better and better and better and better as you do that. So knowing as much as you can about the people who are in the film allows that flexibility. So you're not scared all the time, like, oh, they don't say that really important thing. Because you know, for example, Malala, who's a character in the film, will have an HIV test in three weeks. Right? Will be in the clinic for the test. So you've got sort of schedule in your mind when you can just be you, and when you can be the filmmaker, and you can kind of separate that. So we have a clip from Bush League, and unfortunately, you know, Bush League's a big movie, it's hour plus. And this clip is sort of, again, like difficult Africa, it's not like a happy moment. But the difference is that this is one of the main characters, his name is Chawa, he's the captain of the soccer team. So the film follows four members of the soccer team. And Chow was a really great farmer. Um, and the day I showed up at his house to shoot, um, I thought we were going to go into the field and do some stuff. But what I've learned by now is that with a lot of documentaries, it's like about listening, right? And Cha was a very savvy guy, and Chawa became the director, right? So I showed up, and Chawa said, let's go. And instead of saying, no, Chawa, I need the shots of you out here, I said, you know, you sort of just give them control, right? And so this is the scene that, that's a consequence of that, so. As I was saying, this time, we are, we are taking from from this one. By the mouth of dry, it is dry. So we just dig holes. So there's another way over there. So this water is also the drinking water? Yeah, we drink the same water. We know that this water is not good for human consumption. But there's nothing we can do. We have been grown up using the same water. We don't become sick. We're always fine. So it's a part of our life. It's the way we stay. Yeah. Let's see another way. Which we use? During the month of September, October, November. Mm -hmm. I saw the same. During the lessons, we use this word. So that's a little bit of, you know, it's a, it's a small example where a character, I mean, he, he's, that's all him, you know? He just wanted to show me that. 
Um, so anyway, so I finished this. We shot this for three months. And maybe before we go to the next sort of film stuff, does anybody have any questions or anything about uh, anything at all that occurs to you maybe? Or should we start? Should we start over here? Is that okay? Uh, that's a great. To a previous clip, but um, you know, comes up, yeah. uh, you know, over and again in your films. Yeah. So um, you know, when you're selecting a translator, you're first of all you're putting a, a sense of trust in them that they're actually translating correctly. But you know, you also need um, emotion translated as well. I thought that um, the woman in the the film before this actually uh, that uh, I don't know if, if there was a particular reason why she was chosen, but the way that she translated, whether or not it was accurate, I have no idea, but mm -hmm. the way that she uh, used English to describe um, some emotions I thought was really poignant. And from speaking a foreign language before, I know how hard it can be to share emotion in a, a language that's not your own. Yeah. So I don't know if there was any thought to that or if that was just serendipity playing. There's, yeah, there's some stories behind the translations, no doubt. I mean, there's a very long story. Um, in that particular instance, that's Jacqueline speaking. Yeah, that, she's that's not translating. Judith. She's Jacqueline just, decided to take the reins right there, and yeah. Judith said three words, right. you know. And Jacqueline mm -hmm. decided, "Let me speak for you, Judith, now." Yeah. And I know for a fact because Judith told me, the year later or whenever it was, right. she was very upset yeah. with Jacqueline because she had a uh, some understanding of English. She and felt ambushed. She felt violated that mm -hmm. Jacqueline decided to speak for her. Mm -hmm. Certainly, those were Jacqueline's words. Yeah, that's interesting, and it's yeah. it's a good lesson to be uh, to think of that as you're as you're listening to someone else translate, you know, as, as viewers of, of films and. As so then the translation yeah. became very very uh, complex because I have an understanding of Chitambuka, but I can't understand. Uh, if you and I are having a conversation, you would call me fluent. I wouldn't call myself fluent, right? But when there are three or four people speaking at the same time, there are things that I can't hear. Mm -hmm. There's no way that I can do that. And um, I couldn't have translated the film, obviously, plus I'm a subject in the film. So we had made arrangements. Do you mind if I tell him? No. Uh, we had made arrangements yeah. with this man who worked um, at the museum in Mzuzu, which is the, the largest city in, in northern Malawi. And so I left him money and left him, sent him um, VHS tapes to translate for us. And we gave him like a year or something. I mean, a very long time. Well, and one thing to mention, I want you to keep going. Yeah. One thing to mention is in a documentary, there's a shot ratio. A shot ratio is the amount of footage you shot to the actual length of the final film. And documentaries have very large shot ratios. Like a great BBC, these guys are very disciplined, um, long term professional, might do a 30 to 1 film. So 30 hours makes one hour, right? But there's plenty of documentaries made now because of the digital tools, they're 200 to 1, right? Bush League is 100 to 1, so there's, I shot 100 hours over three months. The final film was slightly over one hour. 30 hours, if I edited it, so people were talking continuously, there was 30 hours of people speaking to the So I sent, I sent two boxes of VHS tapes this big. It was 30 hours of nonstop conversation. So to translate that for anyone, that's, that's, if they were doing nothing else, that's at least six months' work. Right. So it's, hours it's massive. Know. It's massive. And I didn't have I wasn't funded, so it's not like I had a budget to really, you know, bulldoze through it. So anyway. So and we had this recommendation of this man who had a VCR and had a television and who was trustworthy and worked at the museum and, and would be interested in doing it. So we arranged it and, and negotiated a price and his the communication that we had with him stateside was that he was working on it and he was getting through the work and everything was going well. And I kept sending my friend over to ask him. So basically, the the connection, went, the communication went like this: Size in Baghdad. Okay? Hmm, I'm in New Jersey. Yeah. Size so calls me in Baghdad. I call from New Jersey to Malawi, to Mzuzu, to my friend Suzio Narenda. Suzio now walks down to the museum, sees Mr. Tole, asks him how's it going. Great. Suzio will now call me back, hang up, so that I can call him back and pay for the call. Tells me everything's going well. Then I call Sai in Baghdad. Hmm from New Jersey, and we're getting reports on the translations. Right. That's basically how it's going. Yeah. And we show up. Okay, So I go back, and we'll talk a little bit more about why I go back later on. I go back to Malawi, and the man's done nothing. So I shows up with me. So first I go, and he starts telling me, yeah, yeah, no, I'll be done. And I said, well, I'm here for three months. Okay, Sai's coming in three weeks. Oh, 
it'll be done. Don't worry about it. No problem. It'll be done. He had done nothing. I mean, absolutely. He what did he? When Sai finally arrived, he handed us a piece of paper with five pages translated of the thirty hours. Yeah. So he was in a panic. That particular story that day, I I basically put the man in a taxi cab, forced him into a taxi cab, forced him to take me to his house so that I could take those videotapes back. You know, I I didn't want him having the videotapes, yeah. and we basically fired him and told him, you know, what he had done was completely wrong. Um, so then from there, I contacted my former Tumbuka teacher who worked for the Peace Corps. And we went and sat with her. She agrees. She agrees to the price. She realizes it's a lot of work. Yeah. We leave the country. And she puts the job onto a friend of hers. He starts communicating. Now, now at least the communication is more direct. I'm not involved anymore. Now Sai is, is communicating with this man named Jamusi. And Jamusi is um, not doing his job either. They were terrible. It was just horrible. So finally, I fly yeah. size back from Baghdad. Yeah. I fly to San Diego to visit my sister and we sit in a garage for about 10 days straight and go through it was about 13 hours of footage. Mm. And yeah. put 12 hour days in sitting in a garage looking at a little screen and we would he would hit play and I'd listen and stop and what was happening here? Stop, stop. Write down what he said, keep going. You know? It took days. I mean, to the point where we were at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're, you're just completely weary and tired. At least got it to the point where Sai now understood what he had. Mm. And I wasn't doing a very good job, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm now far removed from my tumbuka. It's getting rusty. I can't understand everything that's being said. But finally, we connect yeah. to a, somebody who does the job. Yeah, I found a guy through uh, Professor E. This is where it comes back to Westmore extra expertise. Is you, you, when you're making a film, it's very dangerous to say, I will never do this, I will never do that, because it might be very important to come back to these things. So I, I made contact with a professor at UCLA who, who had lots of research experience in Malawi, who's working with many, many professional translators. So she put me in touch with a guy that's phenomenal, you know. And he knocked it out in a month, what was left. Not only that for me, the way he translated it, oh, he understood me. He's phenomenal. He understood my tumbuka. Yeah. And, and like my emotions, he translated some of my emotions. So when I watched yeah. it, and the, I was, oh, this guy had thank you so much. Yeah. It he was a real been, relief for me because I had a yeah. complex, you know? Certainly, I'm out there, you know? Um, so clearly, as you've been discussing the importance of breadth in any given project and the importance of having a full understanding of yeah. you know the whole situation um how do you deal with kind of compromising or, or having to deal with breadth versus depth over the course of a career like how do you make sure that each project is deep enough that you've kind of put that chunk of your life into it but also that you don't your whole life end up making movies about the same thing like, how do you keep from just becoming the malawi guy mm. well I, you know, my personal point of view on filmmaking, this is my point of view. This is not, I mean, I joke with my friends all the time. I say I don't have a career, I have a very expensive hobby, right? And I take filmmaking really, really seriously, but I don't, um, at this point, because of the state of filmmaking, uh, I just have never made money at it, and I don't think I ever will. But that's also liberating. And what that means is that the only films I have ever made to date Except, you know, excluding a few freelance jobs. I only make them because it's something that I'm deeply curious about. It's, a, it's personal, right? I don't, I've never thought, oh, if I make this, like, this might make me famous, or this would make money, or I've never thought about any of that. Um, so filmmaking as a pursuit is like many other pursuits. You know, someone who's interested in, in development or someone who's interested in certain other things, it's just a way for me to understand the world around me. So I don't really worry about that stuff. And I don't really worry about the way people perceive my body of work because that's not what I'm doing it for. I'm doing it because I've got really burning questions, you know, that are really connected to personal experience. It's usually accidental and serendipitous. I never thought I'd make a film about Malawi, but I went there. And, and really, here's what usually happens. This is, this is like the standard experience is I'll go to a place, a new place. By the way, I mean, the other thing to understand is in the last eight years, every film I've made is in a foreign country. They're all subtitled, right? I've yet to make a film in English. But what happens is I'll go to a place and I'll have an experience there. And, and what I walk away with is, you know what? What this place is, no one ever told me the truth. 
No one ever told me this about this place. Why haven't I heard this? Right. So, for example, in Malawi, um, my narrative of Af Africa before I went there was sort of statistically based. Right. So, if I heard a story about AIDS, it would be like a big number, like seven million or eleven million or whatever a percentage. But when I got to the village, what people talked about was gender. Right. I was like, well, that's what's happening here. It's, it's this gender power thing. Why don't? And so that's. Then I say, well, I want to make a film about that. So that's the path, you know. Um, you know, and so I just stick to that. I had kind of a crisis in grad school where I sort of had a moment where I needed to choose a more traditional career path where I'd get an agent and work in Hollywood if I could. And it felt so unnatural to me because that's just not where I started. I was, you know, the sort of idea of being a Peace Corps volunteer in. You know, my grandmother, when I was a kid, would say, she'd say, oh, the world is so much smaller now, right, because of communication. And when she would say that, I'd get really sad. I was like, God, I'm getting like, a, I'm getting like a diminished version of the world. Well, then I left the country, and I realized, man, this thing is exactly the same size as it was when Christopher Columbus was going around it. It's huge, you know? And so filmmaking for me is just this vehicle where I can go places, and people who don't even know me, because of the tool, if I can establish a level of trust, I can have dialogue with them that otherwise would take years to have, right? So that's the only reason I do it. You know, fiction and nonfiction, both. So. Having, having been in and out of Malawi for many, many years, um, my family has gathered <laughs> lots of footage and this was just kind of for fun and just to capture the time that we were there mm -hmm. how would you suggest that we put a lot of this stuff together to not necessarily to get rich like you said or anything yeah. like that but just to make it make sense we've got so much stuff and I was so excited to hear you talk about everybody's not dying of AIDS and, right. and everybody doesn't have this sad look yeah. on their face. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've got footage of the other side sure. and of mm -hmm. all of that. Sure. How would you suggest that we go about putting this Well, together? let me tell you, in in both fiction and documentary, even more than anything in documentary, the black art of, do of, of filmmaking documentary is editing. It's, people don't, it's not sexy, so no one ever talks about it. You don't see it. You, know, you see the, the cool picture of the person in the field shooting. But editing a documentary is extremely um, demanding, artistically, in terms of resources, and in terms of time. So it, takes a, you know, it just takes a level of discipline. It's like editing a book. It's very similar to editing a book. I mean, what I tell people, when I got back from Malawi, I had 100 hours of footage. And what I tell people, essentially what I'm doing is, imagine if I was in Malawi, and every day I took notes about what I was seeing. Right? And when I got back to the States, I had 100 pages, full words. In the editorial process, the first thing you do is you cut out every single individual word. And then what you have to do is you have one page. Tell the whole story with the words you wrote down, rearrange them on one page and tell the whole story. That's essentially the discipline you're involved in. So it takes a I mean, this Bushley took roughly three years to cut. Now, those weren't all full-time, but one of those years was full-time. I did nothing else, and it took that full year plus two part-time years. It's a, it's a really daunting thing. But one thing you want to be aware of is that documentary, there's modes, and this is another thing people don't talk about often, but doc, there's not one type of documentary, there's several types. One type is verte. Verte is where the world is unfolding in front of the camera. Right? You're seeing it as it happens, but there's a special little caveat. In verte, the audience is aware of the director. So you'll hear, you might hear their voice. You might hear, them vo hear their voice talk to a subject. You might even be aware of the fact that the director is sort of sometimes organizing the world slightly so that it's a little bit clearer for the audience. That's one type, that's it. There's a more extreme uh, type called observational. Observational documentary, the director does not intercede, period. You don't hear or see them. It's a, it's a fly on a wall watching. And so as you go down the spectrum, there's all these different types. There's another type where it's basically um, it's interviews supported by B-roll. So it's, it's a person sitting and talking, and then it cuts away. So they provide a voiceover with pictures on top. And it goes on and on and on. 
So I think the best way, if you're trying to figure out a mode, is you've got to, you have to go watch a bunch of movies and go, this, the way this one's made, like this I can do and this works for me. And then you have to study it and you have to deconstruct the pieces, right? So, for example, Errol Morris is a famous American documentary filmmaker. He made a, he's the guy that basically invented the recreation of documentaries. You know, now you see the, like, the recreation moment. That wasn't always there. He kind of made that up. So you have to figure out which sort of genre you're working in. Now, one genre I would suggest with what you're describing is first person. And what that means is it's you doing a voiceover, telling the story, and it's supported by images. This is a very personal mode that you don't see on television a lot, but there is a place for that in the documentary world. So, and that's, that's one that will give you the most latitude creatively. If you try and make one of the other more formal ones, the boundaries are pretty tight to operate in there. And so it can be really, really hard to sort because you don't have any flexibility. Just want to let you know we have about 10 more minutes left okay. Um, okay. between clips and things. So, OK. Uh, maybe I could just show one more little clip. This is sort of the last big lesson I've had in documentary filmmaking. But Jake mentioned I was in Baghdad. So <clears throat> when we shot Bush League, I got back to the States. I just finished grad school, and I was flat broke. I'd never made any money, and grad school was very expensive, so my student loans were just about to kick in. And uh, so I got this job opportunity to work in Baghdad <clears throat> um, for the State Department as a contractor. And I really didn't want to do it, but you know, I did it. I took all the footage from Malawi and hard drives and my computer, and I went to Baghdad. I was there for two years. Um, so while I was there, I worked at the airport outside Baghdad. I immediately noticed. Um, well, I didn't believe in this war like 1% ever. So it was a very difficult sort of moral compromise that I'm still bothered by. But I saw this thing happening with, uh, on the US bases. Essentially, there's, you know, long story short, in Iraq right now, there are at least 60,000 South Asian men, Nepal, India, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. They do all the labor on the US military bases. So cooking, cleaning, everything. And the reason that is is because uh, they wanted to, instead of using American personnel in the support posture, they would rather have them out. So they've essentially privatized the entire supply line. Like all the stories about Halliburton and all that, this is part of that whole thing. So when I went to the cafeteria, I, I lived on, a, on, a, on an Air Force base. It was complete, you know, the, the only flag flying was the American flag. Um, I would be served by you know, men from Nepal. You know, no one else. That's who did the cooking. So I got to know these guys, and it took a really long time to figure out how this worked and what it was. But essentially, it's human trafficking on a very large scale. And it's human trafficking according to American law. And it's really bitterly ironic because I worked for the State Department, who writes human trafficking policy, right? So um, I started to shoot a little, very small film about it. Um, and I'll say a couple more words and we'll watch the clip. Um, but this, the, the lesson in this for me was that, um, and this is what I like to tell people, is that we're a really special time frame film. Film is, a, uh, is an art form that has really been owned, at least in America, by, just, by people with substantial resources most of the time that it's existed. You couldn't just make a film. And we're at a unique time in the last five years especially because this is really the first time when a normal person can, can tell a story in this, this artistic form, right? And they can, do with, without, they can do with time, not money, if they've got it. And so I think this film's an example of that. It's, um, I mean, the budget on this film is probably less than $25, so it's not about money. Um, but it's a, it's a film that uh, hopefully will make a difference. It's made its way to D.C., it's made its way to the Senate, the House Armed Services Committee, the Pentagon, and so forth. So I like to encourage people that, you know, if there is something happening that you know about that people don't understand, you have this tool now that didn't exist before. And the only thing I say with that is that it's important to understand people think film and they think big audience. Like it needs to be shown to thousands of people to make a difference, and actually it doesn't. A f the right film in the hands of one person, if that one person is the right person, can become a very powerful policy tool. So when I first finished this, I was trying to get it to sort of numbers. And what I learned, I finally got to a guy who's a uh, very committed former DOJ employee. 
an attorney in D.C. who's an advocate, he takes it into Senator's office, just him. He carries the DVDs around, you know? And, and, and the results are becoming more and more real. So that's been a really big lesson for me about what this can do now. On this base, the food service is run by a KBR subcontractor called Gulf Catering. Gulf Catering is a Saudi Arabian company, but most of their employees in the dining facility are from South Asian countries. These men live in a company-run camp outside the base perimeter. Is this where the guys live? Is this where the guys live? Oh yeah, Gulf Catering. So how many guys are living there? No, maybe Wow, one thousand. That's a lot of guys. So in one trailer, in one, in one trailer, how many guys are living? One room, uh, twelve. Twelve? Oh, baby. Twelve. Twelve guys. No, I mean, we get yeah, two six. Basic. I make. Make chilling. No, six people. It's one different day. Wait, nine people. Six seven days. I wasn't allowed inside the trailers to see how the men were living. So I took the camera to a different group of workers and they passed it to a Gulf Catering employee. His pictures show the space he shares with 11 other men. Six sleep in the day and six sleep at night. Many of the men have been living like this for years. Look, I'm not trying to cause trouble. I don't know the rules. If there's a rule that he cannot leave, no problem. I was only curious. I thought, he's a friend of mine, I'll stop and ask and that's all. You know? I think maybe there's a rule that he shouldn't leave this thing. Is that correct? Now we have a rule with all companies that are, we are, you know, we are refugees. All vehicles come in, take the stop and go to other companies. Okay. That's why you have stopped the refugees. Oh, really? Oh, so right. we, have, we have running short of the stop. You're running short of people? Short of the people are. Oh, I see. Because they're going to other companies, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The farthest I was led into the camp was the guardhouse. Uh, thank you so much. Four thousand dollars? You pay? You pay? I know what they are. You pay four thousand? And you make three hundred and fifty in one month? Yeah. How's it The supervisor revealed another layer of the story. You don't have because we have we have we cannot enter the Iraq. We have illegal stuff. We cannot be allowed to stop Iraq. Indian law. You cannot remember India, Nepal, Nicaragua, we have no travel to come here. We are coming to Dubai for the city. Then Dubai, we are coming here in Europe. That's why we are able to get everything. How do you get from Dubai here? You fly, travel, fly, airplane. Yeah, okay. We fly, the new passport. They, they don't take your passport in here. No, no passport. No passport. Okay. Especially for films that deal with issues that you know are yeah. um, have some conflict involved, mm -hmm. what do you do when um, there's a conflict between the what what's best for the film and maybe what's best for the subjects? Yeah. Especially considering your subjects often, in agreeing to speak with you, have mm -hmm. given you a certain trust about their image and, yeah. and how they expect to be represented. Yeah, at the core of all documentary filmmaking, really, what you're just the big thing you're actually talking about are ethics. Right, and you're always, it's always present, this dialogue, and it's in, it's in an inner dialogue, um, and it's a, it's a literal dialogue sometimes between you and the people in the film. Um, you know, I think that you have to answer that for yourself, and you have to decide what, you know, 20 years you'll be able to sleep with, you know what I mean? Different filmmakers have different takes on this. There's very famous films that have been made, have you guys ever heard of Titika Follies by Wiseman? He's a really important American documentary filmmaker. He changed the laws in Massachusetts in the mental health uh, industry with this one film. None of the subjects knew what, how they would be depicted, and a lot of it's very raw. He made the choice. He said to me, I'm willing to take the chance and have these people look bad if it makes a difference. So every filmmaker has to sort of balance that out and make their own choices. For me personally, um, Especially with the stuff in Malawi, this, this was more difficult because this was an environment where you're, you can't talk to anyone, right? It's essentially like being inside of a prison, right? In Malawi, I mean, I would talk to people at length about my intentions, where I plan to show the film, 
what I wanted to do with the film. So they had a very clear understanding of what I was doing. And I actually think the more honest you are, people can feel it. If they don't want to be in it, that's fine. But for those who do agree, you will have, a, I think, a higher level of engagement from them if they trust you. That's all. You know? But those ethics are always present, and it goes back to subtitles. There's a lot of films I see that are foreign language where I question the subtitling. And that's another ethical question. How much are they shifting the story through this, this tool? So it never goes away. And I, I think to myself often that, you know, it's totally possible in 20 years when I look back at these films, I'll say to myself, maybe I got it wrong. That's just the risk you take, you know. Anyone else? Okay, and any last, last words, Sai, on, on, you know, I mean, it's such a large topic and uh, you have such a wide range of films, so um, yeah. we really appreciate your time uh, no, thank you. coming I mean, to Columbia is, Access Television. Thank so. you. Thank you guys very much. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate it. I hope, I hope that was useful somehow to someone in Missouri, right? Thank you guys.